Thank you very much for having me here. It is an honor to speak to an organization that is about people, that is about places, that is about community, making that better uh, every day and proving that again and again and again. So I start out with the question, do you love your city? And I suspect that amongst this group, that's a pretty commonly held belief. We do love our cities. When asked, of course, we, we say we step up and we do something for our city. But sadly, as Anne had mentioned, that's not such a commonly held belief. And it's something that we actually need to work on. Uh, because the vast majority of our fellow citizens do not necessarily share the value of loving their community and being engaged and connected to their place. So we need to work on that. We need to be intentional about developing a love and a relationship with our places. Now, I've been lucky enough to be traveling around the world talking about this issue and asking this question to people everywhere. What do you love? What do you hate about your cities? And it's been interesting to hear the responses. Uh, of course, there's a wild diversity that one would expect when you travel across the world, but there's almost a comic uniformity around things as well. Um, this is cross borders, cross nations, cross cultures. People are remarkably consistent about the things that they say they dislike, the things that they say they hate about their communities. Well, what do we hate about our communities? Well, we hate big things like traffic and parking, a bad education system, bla bad planning, ugly design. Big, intractable problems that we could spend tons and tons of money trying to fix, and I'm not sure we ever truly fix them. At best, we address the symptoms. And nothing, I think, represents this more than the pothole. <laughs> Nobody likes potholes. Potholes are sort of the hangnail. They are the paper cuts of our, of our daily existence with our cities. We, as citizens, complain about the potholes to our city. The city eventually gets around to fixing the potholes. And in many ways, we have reduced our relationship with our cities down to this lowest level function of merely fixing potholes. I can guarantee you this. You could fix every pothole uh, in your community, and you, as the collective citizenry, would yawn, stretch, and say, eh, thanks, streets don't suck quite so bad. No love for fixing potholes, no no, very little emotional return on investment for fixing potholes. Not to say we stop, but I think we can agree to aspire to something more. Because uh, let's face it, if it was just about fixing potholes, you know, paved roads, basic police and fire service, there's nothing that would keep you in one place versus another. Yet clearly, there are things that attach us to our places above and beyond those, mere, those merely functional services. Now, in building this lovable city, you of course have to be, have the minimums. The minimum threshold requirement is you have to be a functioning, a functional and safe city. And in the last few years, you may have noticed, we've been uh, up against some pretty hard economic times. And of course, our cities have been hit incredibly hard by all of this as well. Now, in tough economic times, there's maybe this notion that says, well, let's just make it functional, we'll make it safe, we'll paint it battleship gray and kick it out the door, and that's good enough for right now. I don't think so. I don't think even amongst the most fiscally conservative tax hawks uh, amongst our communities, I don't think they want to live in a merely functional, safe, and battleship gray community. And the thing is, what do we actually aspire to in our places? What is the, the, the higher functions, if you will? Well, how about something like comfort? Why isn't our city comfortable? Um, how about conviviality, in the sense that why doesn't our city actually help facilitate bringing us together and introducing us to our fellow citizens? Why isn't our city interesting? And maybe more appropriately, why isn't our city fun? Where's the fun is a perfectly legitimate question that needs to be asked a whole heck of a lot more as we go about the daily business of building our cities and building our communities. Because think about it, we've all been in those horrible meetings, you know, when we're down there in the weeds wrestling with some technical issue, right? We know those meetings, those meetings are terrible. Well, the next time you're in one of those meetings, I would love it if you would do this. And I want you to raise your hand and say, okay, I see what we're doing here, and, but I want to ask the question, where's the fun? Because by asking that question, you are at least opening up the door to the possibility of something beyond a merely technical solution. You ask, where's the fun? You know, people go, yeah, they, you know, they smile wistfully, yeah, and they raise their eyes to the horizon and go, yeah, where is the fun? Because let's face it, again, if you're down there in the weeds wrestling with those technical problems, at best you're probably going to get a technical solution. But by changing the way we think about the problem and opening up the door to the possibility of things like fun and comfort and conviviality, we at least open up the possibility that we are going to get something beyond a merely technical solution. And again, it doesn't take a whole lot of money, but it does require us to think about the problem in a different way. Now, the things that also humanize our cities are things that very much humanize our cities, that bring it back to us. And one of those things is a, is a bike-friendly city. Think about how much of our city-making seems to be in service to the car. 
Sometimes it feels like all of it is in service to the car. Where to put them, where to park them, where they move, how they do all this kind of stuff, right? And citizens feel that. We ask, you know, where the heck are we in this conversation? Well, if you can become a more bike-friendly city, just a little bit. You don't have to become the most bike-friendly city um, in North America. That'd be kind of hard to do. But if you can become just a little bit more bike-friendly, you are sending this message to your community that says, it's not just about the car. We're thinking about you. How about a walkable city makes for a lovable city? Similar reasons to the bike. But walking allows for two very important things. Walking allows for improvisation and discovery. You know, when people are driving, the last thing you want them to do is be improvising, right? Yeah. No, but when we're walking, we are free to improvise. We're able to walk down a street we've never been in before, or check out this new store, or I've never been in here before. And sometimes, you know, you literally follow your nose. You go, hey, something smells really good. You walk into a place and you find the best oatmeal raisin cookie you've ever had in your life. That's a good moment. That's a moment of discovery. And think about how cool would it be to discover something new about a city that you've lived in all your life. That's a great moment. It's like discovering something new about your oldest friend. And I'm not saying that can't happen when we're in our cars, but it's far less likely to happen in our cars. And it's far more likely to happen when we get out of our cars, we interact with our environment, and we interact with each other. A dog-friendly city makes for a lovable city. Apologies to those of you who own cats and birds and fish and ferrets. You don't walk your cat. And if you do, people think you're rather odd. You walk your dog, and when you walk your dog, you're actually out there using the environment. You're using space, you're using the sidewalks and parks and things like that. And by the way, you're actually talking to people. You notice how when you, there's dogs involved, people will actually talk to each other a little bit more than they normally would, and it's because the dog has sort of broken the ice for you. And a little side benefit, dogs are improved safety, and it's not because your dog has to be an attack dog. No, the fact is, is you're out there walking the dog, and you're creating what Jane Jacobs, the great urbanist, called the eyes of strangers on the street. Nothing worse than walking down a completely empty street, but hey, if there's a dog walker out there, it's all good. It's amazing how dogs and cities actually help humanize cities. Think about that, humanizing our cities, getting back to what it is, and it's about us. Now, the things that we love about our places, personal things, intimate things, and it actually tends to be small things. And in my book, I write about the idea of a love note, a handwritten note that goes with the gift. And gentlemen, all of us at some point learn this very important lesson. When we forget to give the note that goes with the gift to our significant other, right, you, you feel that. Uh, you hand them the gift and they look at you like, where's the card? You know you've missed an opportunity, right? That card means something, that small thing. It says we've taken a moment, we've personalized it, we've made this intimate connection, right? It's a small thing that has an outsized impact on the way they feel about the gift, and by extension, the way they feel about you. So these love notes are things that cities, give to their cities will give to their citizens, and if you're lucky, citizens will occasionally give back to their cities as well. And I've got a few examples for you. Any folks been to Times Square in the last couple of years since they made it pedestrian friendly? An amazing change in the way you experience New York City. In the past when you went to Times Square, the one thing you really wanted to do was people watch. Stop and look around, because it, you know, it's like sensory overload. This is amazing, but you really couldn't do that. Because if you stopped on the sidewalk, you're gonna get run over by a New Yorker. One step off the curb, run over by a cab, right? Take your pick. But now because they brought in seating and Wi-Fi and they pushed the cars to the periphery, it's this amazing third space where you actually feel comfortable looking around and watching our fellow citizens. In the grand scheme of New York, this is a small thing, but it, it, it hugely changes the way we experience and the way we feel about New York City. Uh, small thing, outsized impact. Millennium Park in Chicago. Folks been to Millennium Park? Yeah. And this is called uh, Cloudgate, but of course it's known locally as The Beam, because all good public art needs a nickname. Even if it's a derogatory nickname, that's okay. If it doesn't get a nickname, I think it probably hasn't captured people's imaginations or their attention. So anyways, this is The Beam, and I bet when you approached The Beam, you did this. You found your reflection in The Beam and you took your picture. Click. You took your friend's picture. Click. You took this skyline picture here, right? Click. And while you're doing that, you're seeing people interacting with the art. They're going up and they're touching the art. Art you can touch, that's a little different. You're seeing kids out there playing with it, rolling around on the ground with it, and interacting with it like a giant funhouse mirror. Because that's essentially what it is. And then you look over your shoulder, and you see this. There are these two towers, and these are actually video screens there. And the eyes open, and it will smile at you, right? And then during the summer months, these water cannons shoot water out onto the deck, um, and it creates essentially like this giant above ground pool. And on a typical summer day, you will see hundreds of kids out there playing in this above ground pool. Now, little community making point number one. When kids are happy, parents are happy. We know this, we feel this, right? And certainly these water features help make uh, kids uh, feel uh, better about their, their places and a lot more fun, certainly. Um, now granted, uh, Millennium Park's kind of an expensive love note. It was a $475 million love note. And I suspect that's probably not in anybody's budget right now. 
Um, but lest we think that it has to be all about expensive, um, I took this picture in Braddock, Pennsylvania last summer. Braddock is a small town outside of Pittsburgh. Um, it's a hot summer day, it's a little downtown park, um, and that, my friends, is a garden hose. A garden hose. Um, we have this tendency to overthink our city's solutions. You know, there's a playbook for how we solve community and, and city problems. And it says, well, if you want to put in a water park or a water feature, it says we have to have this many resources. Well, if we don't have that many resources, we say, well, let's table that discussion. We'll try to get in the budget for next year. Sometimes we overthink the solutions. And I ask the question, what's wrong with the garden hose solution? What is our garden hose solution that maybe addresses some of the symptoms? You know, because the kids don't care that it's a garden hose. All they know is that it's hot and the water is wet. So let's think about that. In our own communities, you know, we're paralyzed by lack of budgets and things like that. Well, let's ask the question, what's our garden hose solution to something? Because that at least advances the cause and it gets us down the road at least a little bit until we can maybe afford the full-fledged solution. Nothing wrong with that. And again, that's a great, great question to be asked. What is our garden hose solution? Play. Play is incredibly important to our interpersonal relationships. Play is at the heart of our relationships. Think about those unstructured, unplanned moments when you're just hanging out with your friends and your family. Play. Uh, that's the bedrock of our relationships. Well, we need more opportunities to play with our cities, and certainly public art is a great way to do that. Um, my partner Michelle and I were in Anchorage, Alaska a couple years ago, and this is February in Anchorage, Alaska, and we found this little park in the downtown area, and these are remnants from their uh, holiday ice sculptures. It's kind of cool. We see these kids are playing around on this, and Michelle made the mistake. She walks up and sits down kind of where that little girl in the yellow is, and the little girl in the yellow walks up and goes, hey, you're in my spot. So we had to move, and when we did, we found this. <laughs> now, city making point number two. That was really cool. You want people to make that face in your city. When people make that face in your city, good things happen in your city. Not only do we remember the city and the people we're with, we're going to go back home and say, hey, we had a great time in Anchorage, Alaska. And by the way, when we're there, we're probably going to spend some money. And people don't make that face in your city when you fix potholes for them. They make that face in your city when you surprise and delight them. Surprise and delight. Don't have to cost a whole lot of money, but again, uh, requires us to think about the problem in a different way. Surprise and delight have to be a legitimate objective, along with fun, in how we go about making these projects and doing these community-based exercises. It can't just all be about the hard work and things like that, and the serious stuff. Sometimes surprise and delight and fun are perfectly legitimate objectives in making this happen. Because by the way, you know what that thing that she was sitting in? You know what that was? That's frozen water. That's frozen water, some creativity, some imagination, and thinking about the problem in a different way. Granted, certain parts of the country, frozen water is a little easier to come by than others. Um, we're here in, in, in sunny Southern California. I live in Florida. Uh, frozen water is a little harder to come by. But for those of you in Ohio, my home state, Minnesota, places like that, yeah, there we go. It's a little easier to come by. But we all have stuff like that that's just sort of in and around our community, and it, it sort of begs the question, uh, what do we have? And if we thought about it in a different way, what could we come up with as a creative solution to something like that? Farmers markets. I bet all of you have farmers markets in your communities. Farmers markets are all over North America, and I think they are actually undervalued in terms of how we think about them. This is the uh, Saturday morning market in downtown St. Petersburg where I live. And I like to say it's where St. Petersburg goes to meet itself. Because on a typical Saturday, I'll go down there, I'll see people I know, I'll see people with their kids and their dogs, I'll buy some stuff that I don't need, I'll taste some things that are kind of new, it's all great. Former mayor used to go down there and play his guitar on a pretty regular basis, which I always thought was a very smart political move on his part. Seeing the mayor outside of the suit and tie doing something kind of cool, good stuff. Now, if you ask people what is the most important thing or what they think is most important in their communities, they will typically give you the, the standard responses that they think is most, what, that you're expecting. Oh, it's about the education system, it's about safety, it's about transportation. All true, but if you actually observe their behaviors, where do they go, where do they smile, where do they seem to interact you know, with uh, uh, their fellow citizens, where do they seem happiest? I guarantee you, those farmer's markets go way up uh, on the balance sheet in terms of how important they are. And again, these things cost almost nothing. But think about the nature of those types of, organ of, of events and those types of things. How do we have more of that? How do we improve on the farmer's markets there? How do we go from one day to two, or seasonal to all year? Those are very good questions to ask. Uh, thinking about these things, again, small thing, outsized impact. Now, rituals and traditions. Uh, families have them, organizations have them, cities have them as well. Any of you folks been to Providence, Rhode Island, other than the Rhode Islanders here? <laughs> yeah. Um, Providence, Rhode Island is a city that has a, a river that snakes through the heart of it uh, in the downtown and empties into this round lake downtown. Well, about 15 years ago, an artist by the name of Barnaby Evans was commissioned to create an event, and he created something called Water Fire. And it's remarkably simple. He brought in these uh, braziers, and he anchored them in the middle of the river, they bring in cords of pine wood, and they light them on fire. 
water and fire. Aside from frozen water, it's probably the most basic thing in the world, and it is absolutely magical. Because you go there during a water fire event, you know, you smell that smoke, hear the crackle of the wood, um, see these great dancing shadows that are created all over the city, because it's essentially like a bonfire. And all of us, I bet, have sat in front of a campfire or a bonfire and been absolutely mesmerized by the experience. There's something in our human nature that allows us to watch fire and be very, very content. Well, imagine taking that experience to a municipal level and you have water fire. Now, uh, this is the lake that's downtown there. You see thousands of people will come out for a typical water fire event. They do it maybe eight, 10 times a year. And I was lucky enough to participate in what they call a lighting ceremony a few years ago. And like the villagers out of a Frankenstein movie, we carried these torches from City Hall down to the river, we put the torches into this urn. From the urn, they light water fire. You can hear the Gregorian music in the background, right? Very cool, and it will always inform the way I think and feel about Providence. This is called the Iron Bridge. It's a little town in western Massachusetts called Shelburne Falls. And for 364 days out of the year, <laughs> don't give it away, um, for 364 days out of the year, the Iron Bridge has cars and trucks going back and forth across it. But for the last dozen years or so, usually it's in August, they close down the bridge and they have dinner on it. It's, they bring in the linen tablecloths, the linen napkins, um, students or waiters and waitresses, they have the local restaurants cater the event, and it's a big fundraiser for the Chamber of Commerce. And I think this is great. Because I guarantee you, you may go across that bridge every day, going to and from work, to and from school, but if you are sitting on that bridge having dinner, you will see that bridge and you will see your city with very different eyes. You will feel it in a very different way. And it sort of begs the question, what could you have dinner on in your own community? What might you have brunch on in your own community that maybe helps us see this sort of strange beauty that is in you know, a parking deck or a bridge or a road or something like that? Because we walk past it every day, but do we really appreciate it? Uh, I think not. Here's a good example of turning a negative, or what could be seen as a negative, into a positive. Um, any folks here from Austin, Texas? This is the uh, South Congress Bridge in Austin, Texas. And um, the bridge has the distinction of being the home of one of the uh, uh, North America's largest urban bat colonies. Those are bats, by the way. So between roughly the spring and to the end of summer, the bats are highly active. They sort of come back, and around dusk, they get really active, and they sort of fly out from under the bridge, and they get oh, out, go out into the night. And so this has become sort of a, a ritual there in Austin. You go and you watch the bats. And you know, people go, ooh, bats, ick, you know, send in you know, animal control. No, it turns out bats are actually pretty good for your uh, community. They eat lots and lots of insects. And this is a good example of turning what could be seen as a negative, bats, and turning it into a positive. What do you have that maybe is a negative, that with a little creativity and thinking about the problem in a different way might allow you to get to a sort of an interesting uh, change in the way we think about that stuff? Ultimately, though, the things that make cities the most lovable are people. And they're the people that are in love with their places. And in my book, I call these folks co-creators because they are essentially co-creating the city along with the official city makers, you know, mayor, city council, city managers, and things like that. But they're these unofficial folks, the ones who do extraordinary things that often fly below the radar. But we as the citizens, we usually know they matter. And this is my friend Bob Devin Jones. He is the creative director of a small black box theater in downtown St. Petersburg where I live. And, um, He's one of those people that makes St. Pete a great place to live, work, and play. But he doesn't show up on any sort of official org chart or most powerful, most influential business person, no. But again, for those of us who live there, we know Bob is a central uh, connector, an anchor persona, if you will. You know, we talk about anchor institutions, anchor businesses. We protect those. We have you know, all kinds of stuff and all kinds of language around that. But what about those anchor people? And many of you are those anchor people, or you certainly you know those anchor people. How do we work with them? How do we find more of them? How do we encourage the Bob Devin Joneses of our own community to stand up and do even more? Because they are an incredible natural resource that largely is not, it's not that it's untapped, it's just not being helped as nearly as much as it could be. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. This is Candy Chang. She's an artist from New Orleans, and after Hurricane Katrina, she did a number of projects, but this one was really simple, and I think it gets to the heart of the matter. Um, she made a stencil, and it says, it's good to be here. And she uses spray chalk, not spray paint. She's very conscientious about that, so it washes off when it rains. And she starts spray chalking this message all over New Orleans. And think about that message in the context of New Orleans. It's good to be here. A city that many people thought they had lost. You go, wow, it is good to be here. And when you start seeing that message over and over and over again, that's powerful. That's incredibly reinforcing. You know, we, pay, we spend lots of money on internal branding campaigns and self-confidence campaigns for city, and we want to make our citizens feel better about their places. Okay, we should do that. But sometimes you get lucky, and you find someone, an artist, someone who loves their city, unbidden, unpaid, comes up with something that's so simple and so profound, yet speaks to the heart of the matter in such a great way, it's good to be here. 
That's a fantastic example of the things that people will do in trying to find a way to express their love and their sense of community and the sense that they want to help and that we're in this together. Think about that. This small thing with a huge outsized impact. Occasionally, if you're lucky, these folks can step up and maybe do something extraordinary for your place. Um, the stars align, the circumstances, the right person, right time, and all that kind of stuff comes together. And that's actually what happened here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Any folks from Grand Rapids here? There you go. In January of 2011, Grand Rapids appears on a list uh, by Newsweek magazine, and it was a list that no city in America wanted to be on. It was a list of America's 10 most dying cities. Dying cities. It was based upon population loss between 2000 and 2010, and Grand Rapids, Michigan ends up on that list. Now, if, you, uh, if your city, if something, somebody says something bad about your city, what's the typical response? Oh, new ad campaign, or hey, call the PR company, PR Blitz, get the word out, not a dying city, right? Well, money's pretty tight right now for most cities, and certainly for Grand Rapids, that was also the case. They said, well, we don't have any money to do that. What the heck are we gonna do? Are we gonna live with this moniker of being a dying city? In walks the guy in the green t-shirt. His name is Rob Bliss. He's 22 years old at the time, and he did social media for one of the local TV stations. So he walks into the powers that be there in Grand Rapids, and he goes, I have an idea. We should do a lip dub. Somebody, I'm sure, said a lip what? A lip dub. It's lip syncing to a popular song, and it's usually done as like one continuous videotape. We could do the, the, the Synod lip dub here today. We put on some music, you guys start singing over here, and this would be a big lip dub, because we got lots of people here, but we'd follow it all through the, the audience, boom, 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 all the way over here, done. Lip dub, kind of simple, kind of boring, but a lip dub nonetheless. Rob said, no, we'll make it big, we'll make it epic, we'll get everybody involved, we'll shoot it downtown, we'll use YouTube and Facebook and social media and Twitter, um, it'll go viral, it'll be epic, it'll be great. Now. How do you suppose that conversation went over with city council the first time they heard it? <laughs> you want to do a lip what using YooHoo, Facebook, Twitter, I don't know about that. Viral, that sounds bad. Um, <laughs> by the way, son, how old are you and have you ever done this before? Because think about it. Rob does not look like your traditional city solutions provider. Not wearing a suit, not wearing a tie, and more importantly, he doesn't have a stack of reports that say if you do this, you have these very predictable outcomes on the other end. No. He's 22 years old, he's got an idea and enthusiasm, and he thinks he can pull it off. Hmm. Maybe because they had to, maybe because they saw something in Rob, probably some combination of both. They did decide to move forward. And the city said, we really don't have any money, but uh, we can provide police and fire service, we can close off some streets, and uh, we can maybe connect you with some private money. And they were able to do that. And they raised about $40,000, and in May of 2011, um, they shot the Grand Rapids Lipped Up. And it is this epic community response to being declared a dying city by this outside entity. Uh, the whole thing is over nine and a half minutes long. I've got a little excerpt I'm gonna show you. It involves over 5,000 people. It takes place over a one mile course all throughout downtown Grand Rapids. And remember, this is one continuous take, 5,000 people. Check out the Grand Rapids Lip Dub. Bye bye, Miss American Pie. Oh, my Chevy to the lady, but the lady was dry. Drinking whiskey and rye, singing this would be the day that I die. This would be the day that I die. Can you help me out a little on that? Falling fast, landed foul on the grass. The players try for a forward pass with a jester on the sidelines. You gotta have pyro. This guy's a little intense, though. They said they chose this song because it's about life, death, and renewal. And most people know the words, too. At least to the chorus, right? By the way, they did five takes of this. This is the fifth and final take. Is the one they ended up using.
experienced Grand Rapids. Now, yeah. That video has been viewed over five million times on YouTube. It got picked up by national, international media. Rob was interviewed on Good Morning America, and Grand Rapids got tens of millions of dollars of positive brand exposure because they're willing to listen to a 22-year-old kid who had a weird, wacky, untested idea. What's the lesson? It's not to go out and do another lip dub. It's been done. It's been done really, really well. But in the spirit of that lip dub, let's recognize that the solutions to our city's problems may not look like any solutions we've ever seen before. I defy you to find me in the city manager's handbook, where is the page on lip dubs? They don't exist. Maybe they will now, moving forward, but no, they don't exist. And let's recognize also that the solutions providers may not look like the ones we're used to dealing with. They may be younger, they may be older, they may speak with an accent, they may have the pants down to here, the hats on sideways with tattoos and piercings and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's on us. The next time someone comes in front of you, and maybe you're in some decision-making capacity, maybe you'll remember this thing. You remember, hey, that guy Peter was talking about this stuff. Maybe this kid that does in front of me with this idea, this weird, wacky idea that I don't quite get, um, maybe I should listen to it a little bit more. Because you know what? Um, maybe it's, you know, he seems to be you know, really passionate about this idea. Maybe I'm going to help him. I'm going to say, you know what? I, I don't quite get what you're on about, but you're really passionate. You seem to like you, you know what you, you want to do. I'm going to help you. Because I think it would be a terrible thing if the folks there in Grand Rapids had decided to maybe to squelch Rob's enthusiasm and says, you know, thanks, Mr. Bliss, we'll go talk to our marketing company, we'll be fine. I don't think so. We'll never know. Um, so that notion of wanting to do something is a precious, precious thing, and we should be very careful about how we uh, go about you know, saying no potentially to things and how we might nurture that. Because by the way, Rob does not just show up to do the Grand Rapids lip dub. No, his earliest interactions with the city, he organized pillow fights in the park. Pillow fights in the park in Grand Rapids, right? Pillow fights in the park led to this uh, giant water slide in the heart of in, in downtown Grand Rapids, which led him to the art prize competition, where during which they threw 100,000 paper airplanes off the top of the tallest building in Grand Rapids while the Grand Rapids Symphony Orchestra played below, right? Which sets him up perfectly to be, uh, in many ways, uh, a hero, a savior for his community with the Grand Rapids lift up. So that idea, you know, that crazy notion, why would anybody want to organize pillow fights in the park? Come on, really, is that what we're about? Let's be, you know, recognize that that fun, that surprise and delight kind of thing, they don't necessarily have to have any other point than surprise, delight, and fun at the time. Because who knows what's going to happen? A couple iterations down the road, pillow fights become water slide, becomes art prize, becomes lip dub, a game changer, an absolute game changer for their community. And what if we would happen if we'd, if we'd squelch that enthusiasm with pillow fights in the park? Really, we're not really about pillow fights here, Mr. Bliss. I think he would have probably taken his talents elsewhere uh, as well. So let's recognize that that notion that maybe we don't quite get it could lead to something. And let's be very precious about, you know, about nurturing that uh, idea in our places. Because these people, the Rob Blisses, the Bob Devin Joneses of the world, they're like precious spice. They're like powerful spices. You don't need a lot of them, but you absolutely have to have them in your community in order to make something happen, right? Otherwise, you make for a very bland community. And the thing is, you don't have to like, recruit these folks from other places. You know, there, there's a notion that says, oh, we've got to recruit them from Chicago and New York and San Francisco and all these other cool places. No, they're mostly, they're already in your community. The thing is, is, they don't quite know how to get in the game. They don't think they have the right education, the right resources, and they don't think they have the permission to be a city builder, to be a city maker. We need to change that. And I think it's on the faith-based organizations such as you guys. Because for many people, the faith-based organization is the conduit. It is the entry point from which they take this notion of, hey, I want to do something for my city. And they come to you because they know you can plug that energy into something productive. That is an absolutely critical role. And it's an incredibly important role that needs to be nurtured and expanded. But we also need the idea of, like, let's take that notion and say, you don't have to necessarily come to the church or some other formal organization. You could do it on your own, as the, many of these people have done, existing sort of outside the traditional scope uh, of these, uh, these organizations. And if we're going to go after these folks, the Rob Blisses and the Bob Devin Joneses, what is it that actually motivates them? What is it that attracts them to a place? And I think this is at the heart of the idea, and it's the heart of the way we typically think about our cities. And this is my last point. Most of the time, the way we talk about our cities and the way we promote our cities is probably the way we, most people think about their lives in the sense that we want to sort of line up all the cool amenities, all the cool things that we have, and say, come, partake of our bounty. You know, and cities do this, the amenity-rich city. You know, it says, okay, we've got professional sports, we've got performing arts centers, we've got libraries, we've got pools, all this kind of stuff. Come partake. Now, the problem with this is that it privileges big cities. And the problem with this also in, 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 our, in our personal things is it privileges sort of wealth um, and, and affluence and things like that. Well, it can't just be all about that, because if that was the case, then always the big cities would win and always the wealthy would win. And that's not really the case. 
we need to figure out what else is going on here. And I think it actually has to do with meaning. Chasing meaning is incredibly important. And how might that look? You know, this, I, this idea of chasing meaning in our places. You mean a place where I can go and I can make a difference? I can plug in and my efforts can actually change the direction of my city? Wow, that's powerful. Now that's not necessarily, that's hard to do in some places. You know, a city like Los Angeles or big cities, you know, Chicago, New York, you know, that's hard to do. But some smaller cities, maybe some cities that are struggling, some cities at the edges of things. I'm from Ohio. Cleveland is a good example of a city that's found this sort of heart and is talking about cities in a different way. Detroit, New Orleans after Katrina, um, Cedar Rapids after the floods, Joplin after uh, tornadoes. Places have had to do this. Well, how do we talk about our cities? What might that look like? Well, it might look like this. This is John Fetterman. He's the mayor of a small town uh, just outside of Pittsburgh called Braddock. Remember I showed you the, uh, the garden hose? That was Braddock. John does not look like your typical mayor. No, he's about six foot six, he's well over 300 pounds, kind of looks like a biker or maybe a James Bond villain. But he's a Harvard educated guy, very smart, and he thinks about the cities in a different way. And Braddock is a city that can't play the amenities game. At its height it had about 30,000 people, now it has 3,000 people. If your city lost 90% of its population, most every city would say, you know what, game over, we lose, take the ball and go home. Not Braddock and not John Fetterman. What he's decided to do is say, look, our city is not for everybody, but it is for some people. Some people are maybe looking for something different. And how might that look? What might that uh, manifest? How, how would we talk about that? So he found an interesting partner uh, in the Levi Strauss Company. By the way, I, I want to make this other point. Any of you, any elected officials here in the room? A few? Um, John got this tattoo on his arm after he won his first election for mayor by one vote. A lot of people said, are you serious? Are you all in? Because you know, you came from some money, Harvard educated guy. Are you serious about sticking around? He goes, yeah, I'm all in. So he went out and he got the zip code of Braddock tattooed on his arm. So when I, I talk about this in, with mayors and city council, I always ask the question, so Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor, are you willing to get a tattoo the next time you're up for re-election? There's a lot of humming and hawing, oh, I don't know about that. Uh, but he's all in, so he's a different kind of guy. And he found a different kind of company, a different kind of partner to talk about what it's actually like to live in a place like Braddock, a place that maybe meaning outweighs amenities. So the Levi Strauss Company partners up with him. And a couple years ago, they went to Braddock and they shot a series of little documentary films. And I'm going to show you for what, lack of a better word, is an ad. But it absolutely encapsulates what it might be to, to talk about, what it is uh, in searching for a meaning-rich city, and how we might think about this in a different way for our communities. This one's a little quiet, so let's bring the audio up on this. But this was filmed entirely in Braddock. Uh, this, the people are all Braddock citizens, and the narrator is a child from the city of Braddock. on purpose so we will have work to do. That is so far from what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, it's not even in the same solar system. 
This is not a message for everybody, but I bet every one of us suddenly looked at that and goes, wow, maybe Braddock might be kind of interesting, because there's something probably about the nature of people would come to this, and the nature of who you are. You are mission-driven, you are meaning-seeking people. We are out there. How do we have a conversation with those amongst us who want to maximize meaning, as well as maximizing uh, amenities you know, and resources and things like that? This is a powerful message that many of us respond to. There's something in our DNA as Americans that we look at that and we go, frontier, that rugged individualism, the idea of going to, place, to a place and making a difference, that matters to us. How do we tap into that? And what might that look like for our own city? You don't want to have to get to the point where it's a crisis, like in Braddock or in, you know, in Detroit or in you know, uh, or New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. But you know what? All of our cities would do well to remember a little of this. Things may be good in our cities, but they could always be better. And if we could figure out how to have that conversation, say, things are good here, but they would be better with your help. That matters. Because right now, there's a gap. There's a gap between the city that we desire and the city that we can afford. What are we going to do? We're going to wait for cities to get rich again? If that's the case, I think we wait a while. I think it's on us as leaders in our communities, as people who care, the folks who show up, the ones who give a damn, it's up to us to step into that gap and do something for our cities, to say we love our place. Because when you love something, you go above and beyond for it. You will forgive shortcomings, and you will fight for it. We need more people who are willing to step up and fight for our communities. Because at the heart of you know, this love is belief. You have to believe in your place. You have to love your place. That's a message that you guys need to help carry forward. Because more people need to say that. Because when, you know, when, when people feel that, emotions are matter. And emotions are contagious. You start saying you love the place and you believe in your community, more people are going to buy into it because of who you are and the, and the weight that you carry when you speak up and you do something. Belief matters. Emotions matter. I smile, you smile. You cry, I cry. When more of us step up and say we believe and we love our cities, our cities, our communities will get better. I guarantee it. It cannot help but happen. Belief, love matters. We need to stop just having a conversation about making livable cities. We need to start having a conversation about making truly lovable cities. Go forth, make this stuff happen. You guys are great ambassadors for carrying this message and making something happen. Start small and move it forward. Iterations matter, and who knows, you would become the game changer. Uh, a couple of iterations down the road, and who knows, you may become a true savior for your community by starting small and thinking very, very big. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. We will have some books to be signed in the exhibit hall. Um, thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to you guys. Thank you very, very much.